Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with David Kaiser, presenting his new book, Quantum Legacies, Dispatches from an Uncertain World, in conversation with Amanda Gefter. Tonight's event is part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now everywhere else. Be on the lookout for more virtual science book talks coming up this summer, including on June 21st when we host psychologist Dr. Stephanie Preston for her new book, The Altruistic Urge, Why We Are Driven to Help Others. For new event postings in the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com slash science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. We also have a YouTube page where you can see any previous talks that you might have missed. Tonight's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something at any point during the talk, please go to the Q&A button on your screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for. Um, also a reminder that if you would like closed captions, you can enable them through the live transcript button on your Zoom screen. I would also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage. Your support makes this author series possible and it ensures the future of a landmark indie bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thanks to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, for indie book selling and for science. And finally, as I'm sure you know, with virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm going to do my best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Author, professor, and physicist David Kaiser is currently professor of the history of science and professor of physics at MIT. His work and research on early universe cosmology, foundations of quantum theory, and the history of modern physics have been featured broadly in Science, Nature, The New Yorker, The New York Times, and even in the documentary film Einstein's Quantum Riddle. Dr. Kaiser's award-winning books about modern physics include Drawing Theories Apart, The Dispersion of Feynman Diagrams in Post-War Physics, and How the Hippies Saved Physics, Science, Counterculture, and the Quantum Revival. If this all did not make you impressed enough, he also has two Harvard PhDs, so if that's my mistake, it's actually Dr. Dr. Kaiser. He's joined tonight by freelance science writer and author Amanda Gefter, author of the book Trespassing on Einstein's Lawn. She writes primarily about fundamental physics, cosmology, cognitive science, and philosophy. Like Dr. Kaiser, her writing has been widely featured, including in the New York Times and in Nature, and she co-hosts the podcast Book Lab about awesome science books, just like the one we are talking about today. This evening, the two discuss Dr. Kaiser's latest book, Quantum Legacies, which explores how physicists have tackled the bizarre uncertainties of quantum theory while working amidst social and political uncertainties of their own. The book has such terrific blurbs and reviews. I especially love this one from Sean Carroll, who writes, physicists are people. Kaiser spins engaging tales that both explain fascinating aspects of physics in a lucid way and illuminate the human beings who worked to discover them. Uh, Kip Thorne also praises the book, writing, Kaiser writing in prose that sometimes soars, often intrigues and always informs, gives us here a remarkable set of vignettes about major developments in physics and cosmology of the past century. We are so pleased to host them for this event. So without further ado, Dave, I will turn things over to you. The digital podium is now yours. Terrific, thank you so much, Kate. I wanna thank um, the Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Science Division for a very, uh, kindly inviting me to participate. I'm really just delighted to be able to work, uh, to share this work with you in this series. I'm a huge fan of the series itself. 
So special thanks to uh, Professor Melissa Franklin for reaching out to me and also to both Kate uh, and Benjamin Quinn at the Harvard Bookstore for making it possible. And finally, before I forget, a huge thank you uh, to my friend and colleague, Amanda Gefter, uh, for, for participating with me. I'm just such a huge fan of Amanda's work and it's such an honor to be able to talk about all these really kind of swirling uh, soup of ideas together with Amanda and, and with all of you as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. I have some slides just to try to get the conversation going. Uh, so hopefully that first slide uh, is clear. I wanna talk with you about some of the uh, episodes or moments I wrote about in this book uh, called Quantum Legacies. And I wanna start with a quick reminder. We're gonna hear about some pretty bizarre features, many of which I'm sure are familiar to, to many of you already, bizarre features of quantum theory. But I wanna pause and say, let's remember this is an extraordinary human achievement that we're about to, to talk about. The, the short version of that is quantum theory is simply wonderful. It is an, a, a soaring human achievement. It is by a very wide margin, the single most precise scientific theory in all of human history. And I can cash that out a little bit more. For some quantities, we can calculate from first principles using these equations of quantum theory, calculate uh, uh, predictions for certain kind of uh, uh, phenomena or, or values of, of quantities and so on. Our other colleagues like Professor uh, Gabrielzi shown here, longtime uh, member of the Harvard department, now professor at Northwestern University, he and his colleagues in their laboratories can form measurements to test uh, these, these things we've tried to predict. And at this point for certain quantities, the gap is down to parts per trillion. We have to go all the way out to the 12th decimal place to find any, uh, any mismatch, which is just jaw dropping. So here I'm showing a now famous result regarding what's called the magnetic moment of the electron, which really uh, helps us characterize how electrons will behave when we place them in magnetic fields. The top line is the value we get now from a combination of pencil and paper computation plus some fancy computer work. The middle line is what is the value that people like Professor Gabrielzi and his colleagues can now measure on real electrons in real laboratories. And you can see we have to go all the way out here to find even the, the first signs of a discrepancy. This is just extraordinary. In fact, it's pretty much like being able to calculate in advance from first principles, the distance between a particular bookshelf in the beloved Harvard bookstore and a very specific um, crater or maybe an astronaut's boot print on the moon. And to get that answer right within the width of a single human hair. That's what parts per trillion accuracy is like. I wanna say all that because we also know, of course, the quantum theory is pretty strange, or at least has some features that even now, nearly 100 years later, many, many people around the world are still grappling with, still trying to make sense of conceptually. Here are a few of my favorites. I'm sure many folks have a longer list. There's no shortage of curious or strange uh, conundra associated with the quantum theory. It seems to describe uh, scenarios like um, particles that can tunnel, pass through uh, otherwise solid walls, of course, most famously, and I'll talk about uh, more uh, th this evening, uh, scenarios where at least the equations of quantum theory describe a cat that might be neither alive nor dead, but both alive and dead in the sort of zombie-like state. Maybe even more strange, a topic also very near to my own heart, this notion of quantum entanglement where pairs of particles prepared a certain way can share a very specific association. Uh, their behavior seems to line up, even if they are arbitrarily far apart, on and on and on. Quantum theory is wonderful, but also, as we know, even 100 years later, strange. The strangeness, these beguiling features, had really grabbed me as a high school student. I mean, reading popular books as a kid before I knew enough uh, of, of the topic itself, but it really helped propel me to try to learn more. And so as an undergraduate, I raced right to the physics department my first few days on campus uh, and got to delve in um, there and likewise through graduate school and, of course, um, for many years since then, it's a great, great privilege to get to sit with this weirdness and try to work at it day in, day out with amazing students and colleagues. All along that journey, I've also been fascinated by the embedding, by who was asking these questions, what were they up to, and what was the world doing all around them? And so one of the framing questions that I tried to explore throughout this, this most recent book is how the scientific community more broadly has grappled with these well-known, deep, conceptual questions, these uncertainties, while the people have been immersed within, in some sense, broader and even more dramatic uncertainties of the social and political worlds. And so, as I describe in, in the essays in this book in particular, over the past hundred years, these quantum physicists, like so many of their, of their family members, and neighbors, and friends, have been immersed in some of the most dramatic upheavals in, in modern human history. The rise of fascism in Europe, the 
the dramatic culmination of the Second World War with the dropping of nuclear weapons on cities, the, the sort of uneasy standoff uh, between nuclear superpowers during the Cold War, punctuated by moments like the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, in the early 60s, that these people who have been trying and trying and trying to understand these strange, inviting, frustrating features of quantum theory, they're people in a fast changing world. And that's something that, that I really tried to, to make sense of uh, with the essays in this book. So I wanna talk just briefly about one example, take one of the chapters that, that I had a lot of fun uh, delving into, uh, that I think really exemplifies this kind of doubleness of the scientific uh, enterprise. And that has to do with Schro Aaron Schrodinger's now very, very famous efforts uh, to both introduce a new way to think about quantum theory and to tease out some of the paradoxes or puzzles at its root. So again, as I'm sure many of you know, almost a hundred years ago in 1926, Schrodinger and this uh, a Viennese physicist developed a new approach to quantum theory based on this, what he called a quantum wave function, is now universally um, abbreviated with the Greek letter psi. And it really behaved like a wave, like familiar waves, uh, behaved in many ways, at least like familiar waves, like uh, sound waves in the air or ocean waves uh, on the water. And so uh, he, had, he derived a mathematical expression, we still call it the Schrodinger equation in his honor, and solutions to that equation would, would, uh, would evolve through space and time in a wave-like way. Right away, Schrodinger realized that, that this new equation, the solutions to the equation had a particular feature that's called superposition. That's just a fancy way of saying you can add stuff together. You can superpose or superimpose different solutions. So for example, if this blue curve is one solution to his equation, and this yellow curve is also a proper solution, then so is their sum. We can simply add them together. In fact, we can do more than that. We can consider any so-called linear combination. We can take seven parts of blue and subtract 38 parts of the yellow, and that's also a solution. So this is true of many kinds of waves. It turns out to be true of these quantum wave functions. And that leads to things like interference. Again, familiar when we think about ocean waves, but that led to some kind of curious features when people began to delve more deeply into this in the quantum mechanical um, realm. And as codified by a young, a very young mathematical physicist, Paul Dirac, just a few years after Schrodinger uh, began to lay all this out, the idea began to emerge that one could consider wave functions or more generally quantum states labeled by this uh, Greek letter psi as these sums, these superpositions of states that correspond to particular properties. A particle might have this value or that value uh, for some sort of behavior. And we weight them with some numbers, some constant C. It becomes very abstracted very quickly. And again, as Schrodinger was among the first to realize, this seemed to hold even for opposite or incompatible properties, not just waves on the ocean that might overlap and uh, create interference. But what if we talked about an electron that has some intrinsic angular momentum and ask about the orientation in space along which that axis of or angular momentum is aligned. Is that electron spinning up or spinning down? It sounds like it shouldn't be able to be both. It should be either spin up or spin down, we might rightly think. And yet according to this uh, new set of equations that Schrodinger and Dirac and many others began to work out, uh, it looked like you could create a a, a proper quantum state by simply adding these opposite things together. And that started to lead other people to scratch their heads. So as was clarified uh, some rather quickly by other physicists like Max Born, the idea was that the likelihood to find a certain answer upon performing a measurement was related to these weights, these little numbers that I labeled by the letter C. And so there's a probability to perform a measurement on the electron and find it to have been spin up. There's some other probability to perform measurement on the electron and find it happen to have been spin down. And at, at first there was some confusion. Does that mean that the spin is, is fuzzed out or that it could take any value? Or is it only the likelihood to get a definite value that is subject to this kind of wavy property? And it was soon realized it was the latter, that the spin would always be found to have a definite value upon performing the measurement. It's just, we didn't know which answer we'd get ahead of time. And so this really became a, a rather striking new feature of the equations that what started out looking like familiar waves with mathematics, it wasn't so different actually from a lot of the physics that was already quite familiar to these folks. Some of the consequences became more and more unfamiliar and even to some uncomfortable. And so according to other physicists like uh, the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr, his young acolyte Werner Heisenberg and soon many, many others, quantum theory they suggested 
could only be used to calculate likelihoods, only probabilities. And they, the equations to them at least seem to offer no way to know in advance whether the particles really spin up or spin down prior to measurement. And Bohr actually kind of doubled down on that. He said, maybe this is one of the key lessons of the new quantum theory, that the particle actually had no definite value on its own until we happened to measure it. It's not just that we didn't know and had to, to, to figure out some, some probabilities to say, what are we likely to find? Is that what if the particle actually had no value for spin until we performed a measurement? And that, that's really quite different from thinking about water waves interfering on the ocean. That to me is like saying that a person has no particular weight until she steps on her bathroom scale. Not just that she didn't know her weight, but that there was no value associated with that quantity. And that's a pretty big leap. Well, it's not surprising, therefore, that some other colleagues who were equally expert in this material, like Albert Einstein, began to really get pretty uncomfortable with this trend of reasoning about superposition and probabilities. He wrote very famously to his very dear friend, Max Born, at the end of that year, 1926, that he doesn't think that God is playing dice, a quotation I'm sure all of you heard before. Einstein also began to share his concerns with other close colleagues, including Erwin Schrodinger, the same Schrodinger of the Schrodinger equation fame. Very soon after Schrodinger had, had published this first work on quantum theory, he got a big promotion. He was hired to be uh, basically the senior physics professor in Berlin, a big step up. Einstein was already in Berlin as well. They became close personal friends. They used to summer together at Einstein's lake house. They'd have bash, big bash parties in the city. They got very close. And they began to wonder together about the implications of these new equations of quantum theory. So there's one letter that has survived that Einstein wrote to Schrodinger saying, imagine that someone has placed a ball in one of two identical boxes and sealed it up before we came in the room. So prior to opening either box, Einstein writes in his letter, the probability of finding the ball in box one would be 50%. That's not complicated. And he writes, he sort of goads Schrodinger. He says, is this a complete description? No, all capitals underlined. No, a complete statement is the ball is or is not in the first box. There must be a real value, even if we don't know it. And it must be the fault of quantum theory, not the fault of nature for why we can't give a definite answer. And I should say, again, as many of you may know, reasoning this way about probabilities and statistics uh, in this way about sort of balls and urns, that was already hundreds and hundreds of years old. That was a very typical way of reasoning about probabilities long before Einstein began writing about it to Schrodinger. It dates back to the early 1700s. What really caught my eye is what comes next. The nature of that discussion, the placement from which each of these folks began to, to continue the discussions, that took a pretty significant series of turns. And I think that helps remind us of the grounding of these people in a fast moving world. So both Einstein and Schrodinger fled Berlin soon after the Nazis took power in January, 1933. It turns out Einstein had actually been visiting at Caltech in Southern California when, when Hitler formally took power, and he basically just never returned. The Nazis sealed his homes and his bank account and so on. Schrodinger, who was not of Jewish background, but had very, very strong objection to the new policies, including the, the, the so-called race-based hiring and firing and so on, Schrodinger left uh, his position in protest as well. He, he couldn't live under the regime. Schrodinger made his way at first to Oxford in the UK and eventually spent much of the war in Dublin, Ireland. And before too long, they picked up their conversation again now by letter, by transatlantic post. And you can see they're still grappling with probabilities, with superposition, ultimately even with things like entanglement as we'd now call it. And yet the analogies they reach to, the way they try to make their arguments, that now starts to turn uh, to reflect these new realities. Here's another letter that Einstein wrote to Schrodinger now in the summer of 1935, after they've already now been separated by an ocean. He says, imagine a charge of gunpowder that was intrinsically unstable with 50-50 odds of exploding over the course of one year. It's no longer balls in urns or sealed boxes. And he writes, quote, in principle, this can quite easily be represented quantum mechanically. You just do superposition as Schrodinger and Paul Dirac and others have been writing down uh, for nearly a decade by that point. The quantum state of the gunpowder, Einstein suggests, will be some equal mixture of unexploded and exploded. But he keeps pressing. He goes on in his letter, after the course of a year, this is no longer the case at all. Rather, the wave function describes a sort of blend of not yet and of already exploded systems, but that's the equations. In reality, he says, there's just no intermediary between exploded and not exploded. And if you dig a little bit more deeply about what else was on Einstein's mind at that time, you can see 
He's thinking about things exploding all the time, as of course were many, many people by this stage. Look at some of his other correspondence from that time. He wrote to a different colleague, quote, I'm sure you know how firmly convinced I am of the causality of all events, by which he means explicitly quantum mechanical and political alike. And he's wondering about what causes led to the rise of pathological demagogues like Hitler. It's not enough to talk about probabilities, he's, he argues. At that same time, he had publicly renounced what had been a very, very famous uh, commitment to pacifism. He'd maintained a, a pacifist position all the way through the First World War, terribly um, unpopular in the midst of, of Germany. And he starts warning friends and in public that, quote, the Germans are secretly rearming on a large scale. Factories are running day and night, airplanes, bombs, tanks, and heavy ordnance. So many explosive charges ready to explode, much like he'd now reached to in this example to try to puzzle through uh, the, the quandaries of quantum theory. It wasn't only Einstein. Look at Schrodinger's response. So just about a week and a half later, transatlantic post, Schrodinger replies. And this is the first time we see what becomes known as Schrodinger's cat. It's first written down in a letter to Einstein responding to Einstein's example of the gunpowder that might have either exploded or not exploded. Schrodinger also is gr grabbing examples of life and death. So he writes in his letter to Einstein, confined in a steel chamber is a Geiger counter prepared with a tiny amount of radioactive uranium, so small, such a small amount of the radioactive material that in the next hour, it is just as prob probable to expect one atomic decay as not. An amplified relay uh, provides that the first atomic decay shatters a small bottle of prussic acid, a form of cyanide poison. This and cruelly, a cat is also trapped in the steel chamber. This is just his letter to Einstein. He goes on to say, much as Einstein had done, after one hour, the living and dead cat are smeared out in equal measure. It's a superposition according to quantum theory. Einstein is delighted. He writes back again about two weeks later. Your example shows we're in complete agreement. A quantum wave function that contains living as well as dead cat just cannot be taken as a description of the real state of affairs. They're mounting the charge against quantum theory, which each of them, of course, had been so instrumental in helping to build uh, merely one decade earlier. Much like Einstein, Schrodinger was not only puzzling through live and dead cats in exactly this moment. He had just before uh, writing this letter to Einstein, delivered a 20 minute radio address on the BBC, he was now based in Oxford, reflecting on the sometimes the unfortunate need for violence, uh, individual and even um, organized, when faced with tyranny like the Nazis. He wrote to Niels Bohr around that same time, how he wished they could talk about these things in person. And moreover, he goes on to say, Schrodinger wishes once again to be somewhere permanently. That is to know with considerable probability what one is to do for the next five or 10 years. Living with probabilities was really taking its toll. Perhaps most chilling, at least for me, Schrodinger's essay where he eventually published almost word for word the same version of the uh, cat paradox came out in an essay in uh, Die Naturwissenschaft in a kind of popular science magazine in German that came out that autumn in 1935. The essay almost never appeared in print. Just days after Schrodinger had mailed it into the magazine, the editor with whom he'd been in touch, a Jewish colleague named uh, Arnold Berliner, was fired because of the new Nazi rules about employment. Schrodinger was so upset he threatened to retract the submission but Berliner himself interceded, said, no, please, the work is important, it should come out. Even more striking, you say, why would, he, why would Schrodinger have reached to prussic acid? It turns out that was a well-known uh, pesticide developed in the 1880s and 90s. It was retooled as one of the earliest forms of chemical warfare in the First World War. It's not terribly surprising, actually, that Schrodinger would have thought of not just any old poison, but prussic acid. And even more chillingly, as time marches on, the Nazis actually gave one more tweak to prussic acid under now the, the, the commercial name Zyklon B, and that was what was put to, to awful, awful efficient use in the gas chambers not long after this discussion. And in fact, uh, Schrodinger's uh, editor, Arnold Berliner, killed himself the night before he was uh, re required to report for deportation to one of the camps, choosing not to live with these probabilities anymore. So there's a kind of tightness to this story that's about quantum uncertainties and probabilities in how we live our lives that's unfolding in amidst a series of, of analogies, of metaphors, of points of reference that have some real um, uh, tangibility and salience for people like Einstein, Schrodinger, and many of their colleagues. So there's an irony. By the mid-1930s, just one decade on, 
Schrodinger had become skeptical of some of his own most important work for which he earned his Nobel Prize. And like Einstein, he actually became an outspoken critic for the rest of his career. He invented this now totally famous Schrodinger's cat paradox, not to help teach this core notion of quantum theory, but as part of a kind of critique that he thought his own work had gone uh, off the rails and others were taking it in directions he no longer found very plausible. And even more, if we step back from this world of kind of Schrodinger's cat memes, uh, which we can find you know, a, a one click away, this sort of functions for laughs. It's sort of fun uh, today. Uh, everyone can sort of wink and nod and say, I've heard of Schrodinger's cat. In its own day, it served as a stand-in for a much broader world that had become strange and frankly frightening and threatening. It wasn't only about um, clickbait and laughs online. I want to give a very quick code and then I want to uh, hand over to Amanda. Of course, the question of quantum superposition didn't go away, not in 1926, not in 1935. It's with us still. It's foundational to how we think about the quantum world. So just a few years ago with a very dear friend, Joe Formaggio, another physics professor at MIT, is an expert on neutrinos, a really beguiling kind of elementary particle I also write about in the book, and with two really, really just wonderful students, uh, Mika Lemirsky and, and Talia Weiss, we're able to actually test superposition in a new form of kind of supersized laboratory experiments. We were using data collected by a large collaboration based at Fermilab outside of Chicago, a huge national laboratory, and how the physics community came to even have access to and depend upon and sometimes lose access to machines like these. That's also part of the book, part of the story, this longer quantum legacies. So very briefly, what we're able to do was use data that this other group, the Minos collaboration, had collected over many years on these wonderful, strange, mysterious particles called neutrinos as they traveled from Fermilab all the way north, almost to the Canadian border, where there was a, 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 a former mine that's been converted into an underground uh, detection station uh, just uh, in, in a small town in upstate Minnesota, 450 miles away. And we realized that if neutrinos really did travel with a definite value of a particular identity, if they had a real value now, it might change along their journey and change back. But at each moment, if we could have walked up and said, are you a muon neutrino or an electron neutrino, if, we, if it were the case they had a real definite value in some sort of logbook, then there'd be a certain pattern to the way those uh, measurements were performed, the outcomes of those measurements, all the way up here in the mine in Sudan, Minnesota. There would be none of that characteristic quantum interference that one would only find if the neutrinos instead traveled in real honest to goodness superpositions, even across enormous macroscopic distances, hundreds of miles. So the question could now be posed is, do neutrinos behave the way quantum theory says they should, or is quantum theory off the rails? We can now subject this to a certain kind of test across very long distances. And to make a, a, a long story relatively short, we found, maybe not so surprisingly, that these neutrinos, as produced uh, outside Chicago, detected just shy of the Canadian border, they really, really, really do appear to be traveling in a genuine quantum superposition to very high statistical significance. They're not taking one value at a time and changing it uh, the way we might change our weight uh, even in between we step on the scale. So to wrap up, our own worlds have changed enormously. They've changed enormously in the last week and month and few years, let alone over the, the last century. Uh, and yet we can still recognize the urgency of many of those questions, the questions of people like Einstein, Schrodinger, and many, many others since. The questions haven't gone away. For some questions, we still haven't converged even on answers we all agree with, but we can bring new tools to bear on a frankly much broader and more modern uh, community so that this quest continues to this day. So I'll stop there and I look forward to chatting with Amanda and then hopefully with more of you as well. Okay, um, hi Dave. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was fascinating, fantastic, thank you. Um, so I have many, many questions. I'm sure people in the audience will too. Um, but I just wanted to start by, well, first of all, just saying how much I loved the book. Um, I learned so much from it that I didn't know. And I just wanted to read one paragraph that I thought could sort of set the tone for the whole conversation here. Um, and you touched on it in, in the talk that you just gave, you used this term doubleness. Um, yeah. And so in the book, you write, Ever since my first excursion into Einstein's papers in the Princeton Library, I've been riveted by a kind of doubleness of scientific research. 
In Einstein's day, as in our own, researchers' ambition has often been to transcend the vagaries of here and now, to contribute lasting insights into how the world works that might reach beyond a given researcher's limited view. Yet each of us, today scientists no less than Einstein and his peers, remains unavoidably embedded in a certain time and place. Scientists are immersed in the particulars of the world moment by moment, even as many dream of superseding these accidents of history. And I thought that was so beautiful and, you know, provides such a great um, motif throughout the whole book of this, this doubleness of, you know, science attempting to come to these eternal truths, but the scientists, you know, being very human, you know, flawed, complex creatures that are operating within like particular socioeconomic political realities. And that's informing not only like the experiments that they do and the technology they have, but also the kinds of questions that they're even asking in the first place. Um, and, and I'm also intrigued by how this kind of doubleness is reflected in your own work because you're both a working physicist, um, you know, contributing to that sort of march of progress and at the same time a historian that's looking at all the factors that have led up to, to what you're doing today. So I hope we can touch on all of that. Um, maybe I'll just mention very quickly, there was, um, in thinking about this neutrino experiment you were just talking about, you gave this fascinating little detail in the book about uh, a man named Bruno Pontecorvo, yes, who right. was um, was the physicist who first realized that the neutrinos could be in these kind of superpositions of these different identities. And you point out that he himself sort of lived in a superposition of identities. Yes. So maybe you could tell us just briefly about that. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. That, that's another fascinating story. Again, I, I was able to benefit from, from other historians who've written really marvelous works on Pontecorvo's um, life course as well, Frank Close and, and, and others. Uh, but it was, yes, it is fascinating. So just briefly, Pontecorvo was a young student of Enrico Fermi in Rome in the 1930s during this amazing, exciting time of, of nuclear physics, also a time of Mussolini and, and encroaching fascism. And uh, Pontecorvo came from a Jewish family. It wasn't such a great, it wasn't always such a great situation to put it mildly. Eventually he left, he came uh, to the United States. He wound up working as part of the Manhattan Project. And then soon after the war, actually around 1950, he wound up um, leaving um, Britain. By that point, he'd been working in Britain in, in their nuclear establishment. He left and, and resurfaced. Uh, he, he left without a trace and resurfaced quite mysteriously and to the great shock and horror of many folks uh, in, in the US and the UK, he resurfaced in London. He had to the, to the US, he had defected, he had moved. Um, and the concern was, did he, how much did he know about nuclear weapons, having been a veteran of the wartime and post-war projects? What were his motivations? Had he been a communist all along? You can imagine, you know, just spin that out, a few more clicks of the co early Cold War ways of thinking. This became uh, literally headline news, congressional inquiries, uh, you know, uh, once classified reports and all the rest. And so he, he leads this sort of fascinating uh, trajectory through space and time, let's say. And, and in, the, in the midst of this early work, once he gets ensconced uh, in, in the Moscow research environment, it does look, as I, as I believe is Frank Close is probably the first to have found, it looks like he did at least briefly work on the Soviet nuclear project. And it's not clear to what effect or for how long. Before long, he did have a mostly or entirely kind of basic research career um, at one of their large particle accelerators, Dubna, outside Moscow. Uh, very difficult to communicate with colleagues, uh, his former colleagues in Western Europe and the United States for much of that period. He starts writing papers that eventually get translated into English because the CIA was underwriting a translation effort to publish Soviet journals. What do they know? We better know it. Again, it's, the Cold War drove so many of these priorities around uh, parts of scientific science that we might otherwise have taken for granted. How do we communicate? Who can go to conferences and so on, let alone who's going to pay for the new experiments? And he, he's intrigued by this early love of his of the neutrino, which had been at the center of attention of, of Fermi's group when he was a student from his earliest days. And as you rightly say, he, he introduces in a, a series of papers culminating in few that, that sort of are, are how set the modern understanding of this day of how he might use quantum theory to think carefully about these neutrinos. So he, he was taking quantum theory for granted and saying within that, framework, we should be able to explain neutrinos with this set of equations that would obey something like a Schrodinger equation. There'd be a, something like superposition as, as one of the features. Uh, and that eventually gets, gets known again uh, by colleagues uh, in Western Europe and the United States and North America more broadly, but not easily, not right away. 
uh, and eventually helps to solve a series of really amazing conundrums about um, neutrino behavior and so on. And so he's sort of building up a, a research career under some really kind of world historical circumstances, family drama, he's, he, has, he and his wife had very young children, to get to into Moscow at the last step of it, they bundle into two different automobiles. He literally climbs in the trunk of one car while his young kids are watching him from the next car. I mean, it's just, it reads like a spy novel. And, and yet he is also sort of in real time, pushing and pushing and pushing on scientific questions that we could recognize then and we could recognize now, many of which are literally bedrock or foundational for our ongoing efforts to understand neutrinos from supernovae, neutrinos from outside black holes. I mean, we live with the fruits of this, even though thankfully few of us have to live with that kind of, of, of disruption uh, day to day, even though we suffer many disruptions these days, to be sure. So that's an example where Ponte Corvo had a limited horizon, we all do. He saw things to the bend, he was gifted and ambitious and diligent and worked hard and had great teachers and colleagues and students. He had many, many good things going for him. And he used, and talents to be sure, and he, and he was also limited as we all are. He saw the world from, from particular rootedness as we all do. And so I find that fascinating that we can recognize the questions. We don't always have to recognize the answers and coming back to my own sort of uh, doubleness or whatever it might be, my superposition, you know, this work helps me a, a little bit to say my answers aren't going to aren't likely to stand very long at all. In fact, they'll be replaced on the archive preprint server, probably you know, super surpassed probably tomorrow or, or the next day. Um, but but we can recognize the questions and we can think about the kind of generational handoffs that it takes to keep this sort of inquiry going. That our individual points of view, even our collective community points of view, are always rooted and therefore limited. Um, and yet there's something that we can try to stitch together. It's difficult, it takes a lot of work, it doesn't happen on its own. We build beautiful institutions like universities to try to facilitate that kind of generational exchange. It takes work and it's possible. And I find that actually a bit um, optimistic amidst a world that doesn't always lend itself uh, for other reasons for optimism. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, well, that provides a nice transition into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is there's so many topics in this book that we could talk about. Um, but one of the essays that just really stuck with me and sort of haunts me and fascinates me um, was the chapter on SETI, which is the yeah. search for extraterrestrial intelligence um, and how SETI has, has these really sort of counterintuitive links to the dawn and, and maybe the dusk of the nuclear age. Um, and so, so SETI, for anyone who, who doesn't know, you make a great point that it sort of has like a, you called it a giggle factor yeah. of it, you know, on first hearing it sort of sounds like this kind of crazy project, but this is a very legit scientific um, project using radio telescopes and other technology to try to um, find signals of, of intelligence in other uh, solar systems, other galaxies. And um, and you give, well, I'll just give one detail and then turn it over to you. You, yeah. um, you talk about one of the founders of SETI was someone named Philip Morrison, um, who had worked on the Manhattan Project and was dispatched to Hiroshima and Nagasaki just weeks after the destruction that was wrought from the, the dropping of the first atomic bombs there. And you paint this really moving picture of the scientist who's just witnessed the very real sort of unraveling of our civilization and then sort of turns to the skies to look for what he believes is going to be sort of a more benign, wise, rational civilization somewhere out there. And so the kind of origin of um, the SETI project, not only coming out of the nuclear age, but sort of has this projection of our own anxieties onto the, onto the sky. Um, so I thought that was an amazing start to the story. And then um, in 1961, uh, Frank Drake writes down his infamous equation. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. And I want to also just make sure I, I, I say a lot of what I know about SETI, I learned from, from two really quite extraordinary students, Jennifer Burney and Claire Webb, who worked who know much more about this than I do. And so I benefited from their work over, over many years. But you're right. So the Drake equation, again, probably well known to, to many, many folks um, uh, on the call today. It was worked out really just to help organize discussions at a conference. It wasn't meant to be a great equation like the Schrodinger equation. It was meant to be how do we organize discussions in a workshop, which is pretty clever. You know, who's going to work on which parts of a complicated puzzle? 
And so again, as, as I'm sure uh, folks know, it, it, it was trying to estimate the likelihood uh, for, for contact from some extraterrestrial you know, intelligent uh, civilization, what would be the likelihood to receive such a signal? Well, that would depend on the likelihood for galaxies to form. And that was one kind of physical process some subgroup could try to figure out that like that factor. Then within galaxies is a likelihood for solar systems to be stable, for planets to be within a habitable zone, the kinds of things that we still hear about with exoplanet research to this day. What's the likelihood for civilizations to form? What's likely for intelligence to spark within the civilizations? The last factor, which I think you have in mind, Amanda, yeah. was what's the average lifetime of those civilizations before they self-destruct in what they all assumed would be all out nuclear war. And so there's a kind of through line. On the one hand, they're trying to be as expansive in their imaginations as possible. I don't, they might not have two eyes or two arms. It might not be carbon-based. Like let's think about life as broadly a non kind of earthbound or anthropomorphically, anthropocentrically as we can. And yet they figure there's a kind of straight line in scientific development that leads to, they'll learn about atomic transition. So they'll send their signals in this frequency region that we happen to have just learned about and had just measured you know, in a Harvard laboratory, <laughs> we people, we humans, not me, but you know, uh, uh, some of Drake's colleagues and Morrison's colleagues more importantly. Uh, and that they will, if they can do that, then they're gonna make nukes. And if they can make nukes, they'll probably blow themselves up. So what's the kind of half-life of an intelligent civilization in an era of nukes? Because there must be nukes because they because they figured out atomic transitions because they have a habitable planet. It was just this like straight line. And so the, the nuclear question was there even from this kind of seemingly, as you say, kind of blue sky brainstorming, you know, let's think about wild and crazy um, foreign things. And so, um, you know, that's another example where the nuclear specter is how, how could it not have been in 1961? Maybe that's turned it around. You know, it's months away, they wouldn't know it then, but merely months away from the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, uh, constant talk in newspapers about test bans and is one side gonna cheat, constant worries, rightful worries about fallout and the baby uh, tooth survey to measure strontium 90 levels in, in babies. I mean, that was their world. So of course, one of their questions would seem as natural as, as, as night follows day, much as Schrodinger might be thinking about prussic acid and chemical warfare not too long before. Those are the terms of reference that make sense and help shape you know, our imaginations and even the concrete questions we'll ask. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, and and then you sort of, in, in the chapter, it's everything sort of loops around to this question um, of how we, how we can think about the kind of otherness of um, foreign, uh, of alien civilizations and have that give us some kind of guidance on how to think about the otherness of future earthbound humans um, yes. and how that might help us deal with nuclear stockpiles. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, and again, there it's a, it's a chilling, I think it's sort of, it, it's, it plays for laughs, but it's maybe not so funny, uh, like, many, like many things these days, <laughs> yeah. uh, like Schrodinger cat memes for that matter. But this really, I, I've learned about from, from my dear friend and mentor, Peter Gallison at, uh, at, at Harvard as well. And many of you might've seen Peter's film um, called Containment. So I learned of this really from Peter's work. But um, because of you know, uh, now many decades of a legacy of above ground testing in the United States and comparable legacy, equally destructive legacy in, in the former Soviet Union, that you know, the Americans are in some sense the most nuked populace um, on the planet, or second perhaps only to the former Soviet Union and Ukrainians of course as well. Uh, with Chernobyl. But the, the, the above ground testing regime, which lasted for a long, long time um, after the Second World War, led to all kinds of fallout and related to that all kinds of nuclear waste. So even beyond the testing, um, the, the nuclear power generation from civilian reactors in a, for, for many iterations yielded all kinds of really quite nasty waste where the half-lives are measured in tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. This dangerous stuff is all over and it's not going anywhere fast. Some of these isotopes of, of uh, radioactive plutonium will be, will be harmful to people 300,000 years from now. And there's a lot of it that's concentrated, of course, in certain, in certain places, certain geographic locations. So the Department of Energy realized that this stuff isn't going away. How do we not just bury it, but make symbols so that our future, 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 future selves 300,000 years from now will know not to go digging there. It'll still be bad for them too. Think about, you know, sort of written language as we might recognize today, it, we can measure it in thousands of years, cuneiform tablets, maybe we can stretch it to a couple thousand years, you know, scratching into rocks. 
going from there forward to 300,000 years, I can't even get, you know, like Skype to work. Microsoft Word is, you know, like how are we going to communicate um, with, with, our, with our future, future selves? And so the Department of Energy convened experts well beyond the nuclear complex to imagine how to con communicate with a radical other. And some of the experts they called were experts in SETI because they've been wondering about how do you detect a signal that might not be in a language you know uh, and might not even be in a material form you first recognize. So again, even looking to the, to the we might say a kind of um, quasi-apocalyptic future, SETI and the nuclear question you know, continues into the long, long, long future as well as its dramatic early start. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. I mean, just to give people a sense, like you're thinking, how do I put up a sign that says don't dig here in right. 300,000 years when 100,000 years ago, Neanderthals roamed there? I mean, like that right. is so far <laughs> into yeah. the future. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I can't even decipher like the, the washing instructions on my clothing tag. So I don't know what you do right. in a nuclear stockpile. I mean, I was really trying to think about it as I was reading, you know, you could like what are the just most inherent kinds of symbols and and it's impossible because everything can can mean anything and right you know an x could be don't dig or it could be like x marks the spot or <laughs> right yeah, yeah. um but yeah i just thought that that whole loop you know SETI coming out of the nuclear age and then kind of turning around and, and using those insights um for the future was just a fascinating story yeah. um so I guess we're at a point where I should start taking some questions. Um, I'll encourage people to put their questions into the Q&A, um, but I can read a couple that are here now. Um, so Sam asks, I've read that in old days, Newton and Leibniz argued about the nature of space and time and that that argument is still current. Um, so if scientists working on quantum theory disagree about the nature of space and time, how do they work on these big expensive experimental efforts? Oh, that's fascinating, Sam. Thank you. That's an interesting question. So in, in, in a sense, I, I, I do agree with certainly the first part of your question that some of the ways in which people like Newton and Leibniz and others of their smart contemporaries conceptualized space, was space a substance? Was it um, a, a, an abstract map onto which we, on, through which matter moves? We can recognize those kinds of questions in some of the thorny questions about, about space time today, mostly in the context of relativity and especially in the context of what might be a way to, to merge or, or try to, to bring together the insights of relativity with those of quantum theory, which remains stubbornly on everyone's to-do list, or at least on some people's to-do list to this day. And so uh, trying to, to understand is space time sort of um, sub substantial or, or not uh, is actually um, in some corners, at least that's still motivating new kinds of work. And I think we can, trace that kind of question back even more generations than the ones I was talking about uh, earlier tonight. Now, how do we all agree what, what's amazing and what had, was not clear in New, to the same way in Newton's and Leibniz's day? Newton actually had some idea about it, but it, it, if we were a little anachronistic, is that a lot of our, uh, uh, one of the most important lessons in the last, say, 40 or almost 50 years in modern physics, not quite 100, is what we now often call effective field theories, which is a fancy way of saying that a lot of these theories don't have to be right to arbitrarily small distances or arbitrarily large energies. They can be tested and, and, and we can gain confidence in them from all kinds of cool um, uh, experimental uh, tests and all that within some limited range of accuracy, within some limited sort of set of length scales or energy scales, within that regime in which we think this is an accurate description, can we trust it, can we test it, can we refine it? And that decouples it a bit from needing to also know sort of the ultimate, either at the ultimate shortest possible um, uh, distance scales or the largest possible energies. So to the second part of your question, how do we get along? How do we manage to do experiments? We tend to be able to, to, to craft, test, refine, and, and, and test again, these kind of intermediate range theories with which we can do amazing, I don't wanna say that's like, a, like stopping short. Those are the kinds of theories with, with which we can now make trillionth place you know, comparisons, as I mentioned at the very beginning, for things like the magnetic mode of the electron. These are unbelievably powerful tools. They just happen not to be sort of the last word. And that means that we can craft, we can at least try to craft experiments, both in terms of relativity, um, large masses, as well as very small scales, and certainly also in terms of quantum theory, within a framework for which we already have some confidence because it's in this so-called effective field theory, this effective uh, regime. And we don't think it has to answer, we don't think it will answer 
every question we might, we might choose to pose. So it, it's almost a, a kind of building in a, a kind of intellectual humility. Not all my friends are always so humble about it when we talk about it, maybe. It might not come across as humility, but it's a kind of intellectual humility. We know we don't know about the ultimate sort of on either side, but we have really compelling reasons to think that we have a pretty good you know, base to stand on for these, for this limited region of, 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 um, of energies, of distances, of, of phenomena we, we want to focus on with this experiment. And that wasn't clear to Einstein, that wasn't clear to Bohr, that certainly wasn't clear uh, to Newton or Leibniz or, or Maxwell. That's a pretty new thing, and it's a pretty amazing set of tools that has really taken the field to ask, to be able to ask new kinds of questions since then. Perfect. Um, so Rob asks, what will theoretical physics look like 100 years from now? What breakthroughs <laughs> do you expect in that time? Thank you, Rob. Um, oh boy, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know what breakthroughs we're, we're hoping, you know, what we'll likely to find uh, 10 years from now. Partly that's the fun, partly that's the frustration. I mean, if we really knew, then, then maybe we'd get there sooner. Um, on the other hand, we also don't know what's going to, we don't know what new tools we'll have at our disposal. We don't know what wonderful new colleagues will, will, will join the, the, the community. We don't know what setbacks, uh, or we don't always know what setbacks will come either. And one of the themes in, in, in the book actually was, you know, it's, it's not an unbroken uh, march of triumph, not only because of Nazis and nukes, uh, neither of which, by the way, are merely historical. I still have to worry about Nazis and nukes today, and that makes me really angry. Um, anyway. So it's not that these is a one dimensional, you know, um, a march of progress, even in terms of how we have our resources, what does society value, what do politicians think is worth investing in, those have a, a not so straightforward history as well, even in recent, even in my own lifetime, let alone over, say, the past century or more. So the, the social, the, the, the financial, the kind of public benefit um, um, uh, possibilities and argument. All these things lead to more, frankly, more uncertainties. And sometimes they can really catch us by surprise. I entered graduate school uh, in 1993, one month before the US Congress killed funding for what was going to be the superconducting super collider. A huge particle accelerator that was already under construction outside Dallas would have dwarfed Fermilab. Frankly, it would have dwarfed uh, the Large Hadron Collider that's still uh, such a wonderful tool uh, in Geneva at CERN. I entered grad school one month before that was killed. That was a, a one year, 50% reduction in the total budget for high energy physics in one year. That wasn't a 5% you know, um, a market adjustment, cut it in half. Not just because for that one thing, that by killing that one project, funding for the entire field fell by half in one year. Not many people are prepared for that kind of uh, uncertainty if you're making 10, 20 year plans for building new instruments and training new students. So that's my, that's why I'm gonna punt on your very good question say, I don't know, and I'm not sure we can know because so much of this still is out of our own, of, of our own hands. That's great. I'm gonna sneak in my own question um, based on, you were just talking about teaching and um, I, I found myself wondering, um, reading the book, you know, given that, given this doubleness of science that we, we come to these amazing ideas, but they're also, you know, rooted in these very contingent factors. Um, it's sort of interesting that we tend to teach physics. We, we kind of um, reinforce these contingent paths by teaching things in the order in which they were just sort of accidentally discovered, right? So yeah. we learn Newtonian physics first, and then we learn special relativity, and then general relativity. And, right. you know, that you could make an argument that maybe there's a more like quote unquote rational way to just get to the the things that we think are most true as yes. opposed to teaching these contingent sort of pathways and, and I'm curious if but I could see an argument on, on the other side too I'm curious as a teacher what you what you think of that yeah so you know um Amanda, Amanda and I've had the chance to teach together a few times actually this is a question we can both uh, chew on together even beyond uh, just this evening I so I don't think it's entirely laziness or randomness for the reason why we have the curriculum in the order that we tend to in physics. It certainly could be changed and improved. I'm not saying we should never change it, but I don't think I don't think it's only an accident if we learned this first. I think we've gotten in the habit of trying to do multiple things with these classes in order, as as, as you would know as well. So electromagnetism, my, uh, classical electromagnetism, Maxwell's great uh, great contributions and those of his contemporaries. We can sort of see, smell, taste that a bit more easily than some of the more esoteric things in atomic nuclear physics or general relativity. 
So we can do a little bit more hands-on labs, a little more easily, also sometimes a little less expensively. And then we can use that to then learn all kinds of techniques, mathematical techniques, that we know are gonna be much more important on areas that are much less easy to grab, put our hands on, to literally put our hands on. Like, you know, Green's functions, we want to, to, to use one example. So the mathematics of waves, uh, for which Maxwell waves, waves of light, are a, a terrific example. We can we have a, a little bit better understanding of, of waves going in. We can learn some super fancy techniques to characterize those waves more quantitatively, and then use those techniques even when the waves we're talking about are a little less you know immediate and, and, and come to mind. So I think that helps explain the staying power of our of our stepping stones. Not that it should never be changed, but I think we've we've, we've realized how to do more than one thing as we as we encounter each new topic. Over the years, though, like clockwork, every roughly 10 years, some group of, of physics educators, very earnest and talented educators, will kind of, I joke, like get religions and scrap the whole curriculum, start from quantum mechanics. It's like, you know, and they write often very creative books. It's not like it's a horrible thing, but they're, they're, they're pushing that rock up the hill. And I think there's reasons why we do keep reverting, not only out of comfort or familiarity. I think there's a kind of building up from things that might be modestly more accessible, familiar, maybe even intuitive to, to areas that are, are less easy for us to literally get our hands on. Yeah. And we wanna be ready for those. So we can do those with, with a kind of uh, mental discipline and, and care uh, once we get to them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I'm just checking the questions here. Um, so Jennifer asks, what recent and current conversations, if any, are you and your colleagues having with theologians about common ground? For example, the theological implications of entanglement. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. So uh, maybe it's a great chance to advertise my, my colleague, uh, um, Frank Wilczek, Nobel laureate, um, another professor at MIT, just received the John Templeton Award for kind of outstanding achievement at, at fostering, I think, exactly those kinds of dialogues, not for professing a certain um, article of faith, but for being open to and fostering you know, respectful, grounded, thoughtful discussions about, we might say, uh, science and faith or, or, or broad terms like that. So it's, it, it is alive. There's certainly a place. It would be a year or two before that, another very dear friend and mentor of mine, Marcelo Gleiser, won the same award. So in my own immediate circle, I have many uh, colleagues and mentors and, and, and people I very much look up to uh, who, who, for whom this is, this is a very, very urgent question. For me, I, I I don't mean to be cheeky. I often revert to a great line uh, that Galileo wrote to the Grand Duchess uh, Christina in the early 1600s, which was to say, why should we ever think there's, there's a, a, a conflict between science and religion? And he wrote in this memorable term, memorable turn of phrase, that the Bible uh, teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. I'm sure it's even better in the original Italian, but I just, that always stuck with me. That who says there has to be a showdown or a zero sum game? And I might have my personal inclinations with thoughts, but it certainly shouldn't be um, uh, an assumption that's gonna crowd out or somehow uh, logically disprove other ways of trying to grapple with you know, the larger uncertainties within which we're immersed. So that's at least how I try to come to that general question on the, on the particular topic of entanglement. I don't know, I, I, there, I've seen many, um, let's say over interpretations where entanglement is taken to mean things that I think it doesn't quite mean, not only in the sphere of, of, of um, faith or theology, but in other spheres of, uh, of, of um, mind reading or other kinds of, you know, uh, interesting, but maybe not so straightforward phenomena. So I, I, I'm a little careful about entanglement because I've done so much work on, on the physics side and I've, I've tried to characterize what it, what it doesn't mean. Or what are the limits of entanglement? So on that very specific part of your question, I may be a little more reticent, but for the, what I take to the impulse behind it, I, I think there's a lot of, still a lot of interesting discussion and, and more work uh, to, to continue in that vein. Fantastic. Um... I'm realizing I'm not sure exactly when we need to stop, but um, let's see here. You mentioned Wilczek and uh, Robert asks, he says Wilczek once uh, wrote a paper saying the concept of the ether is still very much alive. Um, and what do you think of that? It's a, it's a great question. So um, I, I, I think what Frank meant, um, was that we, we still tend to think about all pervasive substances in which we are immersed and to which we appeal to explain phenomena. So one of those might be a kind of quasi-elastic uh, substance of space-time as described by this sort of warping, distending trampoline picture that we have from Einstein's beautiful general theory of relativity. 
in, in, in more recent discussions, we can think about the Higgs field related to this now famous Higgs boson, which in our winning account or our standard model account, as I write about a bit in the book, is how we account for why things have mass, why we measure particles as having mass. Maybe they have no mass intrinsically, but they're immersed in this sort of all pervasive stuff, which starts to sound kind of like the 19th century ether. Now, as Frank was very careful to say, and I'll want to be careful to say, it's not exactly the same. And so, for example, uh, the ether, uh, as described in the 19th century, was really at odds with our understanding of relativity, that, that, that the laws of physics should hold independent of, um, of kind of where you are, where you're sitting, and, and, and uh, what day it is. They should have a kind of um, symmetry in space and time that, that being rooted in a physical substantial ether um, would, would not have. And so likewise for the Higgs field, it is, we would in fancy terms say, it's a, it's a relativistically invariant substance. So it, it doesn't um, have all the properties of the 19th century luminiferous ether. What it does share with the ether is that we think it really is all pervasive filling every nook and cranny universe. We're sitting in it and we appeal to that to explain some otherwise pretty strange uh, phenomena in the natural world. So we might call it echoes of an ether are actually still quite helpful today. It's, it's not literally the same notion of the ether from, from, from 100, 150 years ago. Fantastic. Well, I'm being told that that, that has to be our last question, unfortunately. Um, but thank you so much uh, to everyone who asked questions. And I just want to encourage you all to get the book. It is fantastic. And there's so much more than we had time to talk about tonight. Um, but this was great to get to talk to you, Dave. And um, thanks to everybody. Amanda, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you both um, for this fascinating, original, and I thought really accessible talk and Q&A. Um, Amanda, your questions were so interesting and thoughtful. So thank you for that too. Um, thank you everyone out there for joining us this evening and for asking some awesome questions. I could not have thought of better ones myself. I was really thrilled. Uh, if you would like to learn more, copies of Quantum Legacies are for sale on harvard.com via that link that I provided in the chat and on our website. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, have a great evening. Keep reading, keep learning, and please be well. Thanks everyone. Thank you.